called toxic inequality. And I want to start off by uh, suggesting, maybe provocatively to some people, uh, that inequality really is not the issue. And never quote me as having said that. <laughs> because, of course, it's always the issue. But I want to suggest tonight that it's really not the issue. Because we, in fact, in every recorded history of the world, have witnessed inequality, sometimes extreme levels of inequality. And for better or worse, we're going to have inequality. Inequality is going to endure. What I want to suggest is that in the United States, we have entered into a qualitatively different era. And that's the era that I call toxic inequality. And I want to distinguish that era from the run of the mill inequality in the following way. It is characterized by historically high levels of resource inequality. And I'm going to talk a little more about that momentarily, specifically inequalities in income and inequalities in wealth, inequalities in access to high quality educational institutions, uh, inequalities, uh, massive inequalities in healthcare, as we're beginning to understand a lot better. We have crossed a threshold, I believe. A threshold where the levels of inequality are greater than we have seen since the pre-depression here in the United States. Some people even measure it as achieving the levels of inequality that we saw in the so-called Gilded Era in the 1880s and 1890s in the United States. But the statistics don't tell the whole story. And I would suggest they tell a lot of the story, but they leave out something very important. What they leave out in this instance is that toxic inequality for me means that the level of inequality has reached a dysfunctional level in American society. It is leaving us dysfunctional in terms of the aspirations of young people, of people in school, who think that they really can make it anymore in the United States. It's dysfunctional in terms of the United States being able to compete in a future global economy. The haves and the have-nots, the hollowing of the middle, is really critical to the way the United States is perceived in the rest of the world. And that is becoming exceedingly problematic. It's dysfunctional also in terms of everybody needs to succeed at some level in the United States as a society for us to keep the aspirations that are born out of our notions around achievement, opportunity, and meritocracy. Without those aspirations, there are very few, I would suggest, sources of innovation. So in those ways and others, toxic inequality is a very different kind of era that we have entered in the United States. Let me suggest that the way I look at toxic inequality, it results from uh, a perfect or imperfect storm, if you will. An imperfect storm of three intersecting forces, some of which are beyond our control and we need to deal with as a society. The first one is what we sociologists and others call a demographic shift. The ethnic, racial, age, immigrant status composition of the United States has been changing for a period of time. I would suggest it's sped up you know, quite drastically in the last decade or so. So that the following, for me, the following reflective pieces of data capture the transition that we had made. 2013, last year, was the first year in American history where there were more newborns of color than white newborns. Dem demographers tell us that by about 2042 or 2043, depending on whose projection you want to look at, the United States is going to become a majority minority nation. That is, no one group is going to have a numerical majority. This is overlaid with age. Approximately 27% of senior citizens are non-white, whereas 47% of youth are youth of color. So you get a whole host of demographic transitions happening there. Demography is not destiny. 
and there's a level at which we might suggest, so what? <laughs> the society's changing. We've dealt with uh, pretty severe changes in the past. Um, we can deal with this one. Let me suggest that our institutions uh, were neither built for nor for the most part have demonstrated capacity to handle this transition. One can think of schools and the very divisive uh, policy, language, and public outcry we have over language, for example. Who's going to have to get here who? Who's in America? That gets played out in schools all over, all over our nation. It gets played out in other institutions as well. It gets played out in Social Security. Who is going to pay into Social Security? Who are the young workers going to be that tend to be workers of color to finance the golden years of workers that retire that tend to be white? And what are the dynamics of that like for the society? Who's going to buy the homes that is the main source of wealth for middle class Americans? Who's going to buy those homes to secure their golden years? We need, if you will, people, groups coming up behind us that are doing well enough to be able to buy those homes. So the demography, the demographic shift, is the first part of that perfect storm for me. The second part is what I referred to already, that historic high levels of inequality. And let me maybe just capture a, a couple of those for us here. What are we talking about? No matter how we measure it, Income inequality, whether we measure it by what the economists will tell us is the Gini coefficient, the distribution of income throughout the society, or whether we measure it by how much the very top gets, or whether we measure it by the median income, or we, whether we measure it by how much the very wealthy get in comparison to those right in the middle. Those indicators tell us that the level of income inequality is at that historic. Income is the resources that we receive mostly from our work, or if we're unable to work, or the society doesn't have work for us, or if we're retired, it's the substitute that we receive from the paycheck. Wealth, on the other hand, is something uh, a bit different. Income is like a stream that goes by. It comes in, and for most of us, if you're like me, it goes out. At the end of the month, uh, maybe, maybe it's a struggle, maybe it's not a struggle, and maybe you have to make some choices. Um, that's why a lot of us have credit card debt. Wealth is, is not a stream, a flow that goes by us. Wealth is a, a, re, a reserve. It's like a pond. It's a storehouse of resources. It's also different in the form of it tends to look like savings, stocks, bonds, certificates of deposits, anything you have of value that you can sell, like my watch. Maybe not a whole lot of value. <laughs> the equity that you built up in your home, how much more you can sell the home for than what you put in and the money that you still owe. Everything you own minus all your debts. That's wealth. People don't buy groceries with their wealth. People don't pay their mortgage or their rent with their wealth. Wealth is used for very different purposes. Primarily, it's used first as a safety net. Winter's about to come. Potholes are going to get deeper. If you need a new set of tires or you break an axle going over those potholes, because our public investment is not very great these days, uh, chances are you can't take that out of your paycheck. Chances are you're going to have to give into your bank account or get a loan. So safety net purposes. That cousin somewhere who gets arrested and needs to be bonded out. I hear I'm hitting a cord somewhere there. <laughs> the uncle that needs to pay for the lawyer for whatever reason. You're thrown out of work. You dip into that reservoir of wealth for your own private safety. That's the first use. The second use is quite a bit different, where wealth is a very special kind of money. It's what we use for what I would call our opportunities for advancing ourselves and our families. 
It's what we use for, some of us, use for down payments on a home. Um, to navigate a really weak public school system and buy private school, prep school, parochial school, whatever it is, as an alternative. It allows some people to start businesses. It's that investment capital. If you don't have it, advancing is not impossible, it's just that much more difficult. The third part of the perfect storm for me is the racial and ethnic overlay. Where the inequalities I've talked about, whether it's health disparities, whether it's home ownership, income, jobs, and wealth, all rest on a very deep division built along rate historically around racial and ethnic lines in the United States. So, for example, <coughs> the median wealth of white families in the United States, median, half above and half below, not the average half above and half below. Bill Gates walks in, he does a lot for our, our mean, he doesn't do anything for our mean. We don't all get to share as well. Sorry. <laughs> Median wealth for white families is $110,000. That includes home equity, by the way. Median wealth for African American families is $5,700. For Hispanic families, it's $6,300. 110. 57 or 63 for families of color. Another way of putting that is that for every dollar of wealth the average, or typical if you will, white family has, the African American family has five cents. But the actions and dynamics of public policy and institutional dynamics that continue to widen that gap every single day. And that's what I want to focus on. So what does that look like? Um, I should have hold, held you in a little suspense and tried to set this up a little more. The, the graph I put up on the slide is a study taken from a database that has followed the same set of families since 1980, well, earlier, but since 1984, when those families were asked about their financial assets, their wealth, and a whole lot of other questions. It followed that same set of families all the way they still follow them. And so rather than taking a snapshot in time, we're now able to look at the, question, the, the data and ask a question, when people start off at a certain wealth inequality, does that widen? Does it close? Does it stay static? Does it stay about the same? And what's our understanding of that? So from the data that's up there, these are, are just two of the lines, if you will. I didn't put up the Hispanic line for the moment. We can bring that up in conversation later. I'd be happy to talk about that. In constant dollars, the same, what the dollar bought in 1984 here, it also buys in 2008. The racial wealth gap opens up at about $85,000. Bad enough, but right on line with some of the data that I mentioned earlier. But look what happens over the course of one generation, over 25 years, as these families that start off in 1984 experience the American workplace, American schools, American public policy, and institutions. That gap goes up by two and a half times, from 85 to 230-something thousand dollars. So something is happening in spite of, I would say, alongside the tremendous advances in customs, law, around civil rights, around equal opportunity, to neighborhoods, to schools, to real advances on the part of African Americans and other families of color, but mostly measured in the income level and by middle class professional status. The wealth story tells us something that's very consistent and I deeply troubling for, for, for me and I think a lot of others. What I wanted to look at, and what my team wanted to look at, and we continue to, because work continues for us, 
in this data is not simply to look at the two lines, but to think really hard and analytically about the space in the middle. Now, they told me not to move, but I'm going to move here for, for half a minute. So, the space in the middle keeps getting bigger, right? How do we analyze, how do we think about what causes that? What are the drivers of that? So in the work we've, some of the work we've been doing, for example, we looked at the change of wealth over these 25 years for the, this set of families, white and black. And then analyzed what are the indicators, the drivers of the change in wealth and the difference of the change in wealth between whites and blacks. All right, I tried to speed through that. Let me give you the numbers really quick. By far, accounting for approximately 27% of the differential wealth accumulation rates for whites and blacks over the 25 years. My statistician tells me I have to say it exactly like that. Dynamics around home ownership account for about 27% of the difference. The largest part by far. And I said very vaguely, dynamics around home ownership, because I want to do a dive into that in a few minutes. In some ways, that shouldn't be surprising, because for the wide swath of middle-income American families from the 20th percentile to the 80th, that 60% of us in the middle, some of us are up one way or down one way, I don't know what, but most of us are in the middle. <laughs> Two-thirds of our wealth is in our home equity. It's not in savings or stocks and bonds. <coughs> it's not the way some people would have told us you have to accumulate enough. Scrimp, save, all that's as important, all that is important. But the institutional dynamics around how people buy homes, the regulations that are set, what finance companies can and can't do, residential segregation, all of those come into play in the institutional arena <coughs> of how does one value homes in different communities. What the realtors blithely call location, location, Location. <coughs> Let me translate that. Location, location, location. Demographics, demographics, demographics. Who are the people in that community? The sociologists among us and the social scientists among us know very well that the higher percent a community becomes non-white, the lower the value of the home goes up. the more large homogeneous a community is, uh, both in, in racial terms, the more homogeneous white and the more solidly upper middle class income it is, the higher the ceiling is on home equity. And that has something very deeply to do with, uh, with our history, obviously. All right, so home ownership is by far the largest. Let me run through the others fairly quickly. Dynamics around income, work account for about 17%. Let me just throw out something that hopefully provides a, uh, some ammunition for a question later. I, I want you to sort of not to understand it in a way. The 17% difference there is not because whites and blacks have different income. Using the statistical techniques we use, regressions, what it means is it's a difference about the return of each dollar of income to wealth capture something different, not simply the difference in incomes, but I believe the sector where people work, the benefits attached to that work, and a lot of other, a host of other things. Dynamics around unemployment account for another 5% of the difference. And let me suggest here, um, every month the Bureau of Labor Statistics releases uh, much awaited data, about three or four of them. One is about the unemployment rate. Today it released the jobs rate. What did it do to the stock market? Oh, I think almost 1%. Considered, that's how widely awaited a lot of these reports are. The unemployment statistics are one of those. It captures unemployment at one point in time. Last month, who was unemployed? And what that percent looks like. With a database that looks at families over 25 years, we can start to ask, I think, 
some deeper kinds of questions, not just the one-time rate of unemployment, but how many spells of unemployment does a family have? What's the duration of each spell? How long are they unemployed? When they get back to work, what, what are their wages like? What is it like for other members in their family? So having that broader view around the spell of unemployment here, that, that accounts uh, for that, that 5%. And lastly, before I move on here, dynamics around, and if you're reading, thank you for those of you that read The Hidden Cost of Being African American. I expect really good questions later. Trip, trip me up questions. Um, inheritance. And what we call in vivo transfers money that's passed along before a family member is deceased, much more, more likely to be in the form of a, a, a down payment for a home. I won't do it today, but you can think yourself. It's very difficult in the American society today for a young couple or a single person to be a first-time home buyer without significant financial help from their families for the down payment. We just have not, we don't save like that here. We don't do it. In fact, of the 185 families we interviewed uh, for the hidden cost of being African American, uh, half white, half black, uh, middle class, working class in three cities, every single homeowner, white and black, every single one of those homeowner families received help from their families to pay their down payment. That's how significant it is. So inheritance and those kinds of transfers account together for about another 9% of the difference that we see in the, the space in the middle of that triangle. Right. So let's take a, a rather typical person. Um, and I, have, I can present about 10 cases now. Uh, there's only one I want to go with. In 1998 and 1999, my research team interviewed the 185 families that we all talked that I just talked about. To be eligible for that study, because there were some things, dynamics I wanted to capture, they all had to have school-age children about to enter school. So we could talk about their plans for school, uh, their plans for community, their plans for home, uh, how they were going to try and better their family you know, in a quick nutshell. We had the opportunity to re-interview them 12 years later, where their then five-year-olds, if they had stayed on track, would have been about ready to graduate high school. So we, we have stories and data uh, for a lot of, most of those families, again, 85% of them. And those stories are really intriguing. Um, announcement, my next book, <laughs> is going to be built around that database. Uh, but let me tell you one, let me tell you about Patricia Arroyo. Some of you may or may not remember Patricia if you've been reading The Hidden Cost of Being African American. 1998, Patricia Arroyo, uh, living, uh, born uh, to a mother on welfare in Watts, South Central Los Angeles. Uh, Patricia Arroyo has um, children at a young age. And uh, like some of the experts would predict, the cycle of poverty uh, grabs hold. And she, too, goes on uh, social assistance. When we first talked to her in 1998, she had just finished a training program. As she said, she learned the computer. And she had just started work for Los Angeles County, pushing papers for adoption services that paid her then, uh, but still talked to us about menacing men in the alleys and the corners that she felt confronted she and her daughters as they walked home from school. And she was looking to move on. And that's sort of where we left her story. She was beginning to make it. Uh, one wouldn't know whether that job worked out for her, what the economy would do to her, what would happen with her kids. We caught up with her in 2010. She now makes $50,000. She's a, a solid member of the income middle class. Still working for Los Angeles County. She had worked her way up in responsibilities and job titles. 
and over the 12 years of some pretty good salary increases. Her wealth had gotten her to $7,000. Most of that was in the form of pension or, re or retirement funds. That was Los Angeles County sort of mandates and contributes to that. When we caught up with her, you know, we're, we're doing the interview, we're listening to the tape, we're analyzing it, and uh, Patricia is, um, she's a success story, right? She's one of those uh, hundreds of thousands of young women of color who make it. Who do to her own training, grit, and I would say a lot of her own, her own perseverance and character and drive makes it, makes it out of South Central, makes it out of Watts. It doesn't just settle for that first move a little, a little away. When we saw her, she had moved to uh, one of those exurbs in Los Angeles that was 55 miles away, seeking still a safer community. It was the second home she had owned. Now, I'm not going to tell her whole story today. But I want to put side by side with her success story of her own hard work and earning. The story of the foreclosure crisis, where the home she owns near Fontana, California, near some old steel mills, is what we call underwater. She owes more on that home than that home is worth. The foreclosure wolf is at her door. All the wealth that she had accumulated is sinking with the values, the home values in that community. Where when I visit, um, I doesn't take, it takes a lot to shock a jaded sociologist like myself. Every third home had a foreclosure sign by it, the foreclosure sale. And you know, then maybe one or two lawns foreclosure sale. Her home didn't have that sign, she was still paying it up. So the story gets messy, as all these stories get messy. But they also are illustrative of how hard-earned achievements can be dangerously threatened by things totally outside of her control. Well, maybe not totally, maybe she didn't have her fault for buying a home. Well, there are millions of American families that bought their homes. By the way, because I know this comes up, she was married. We can get into that narrative uh, perhaps later if people want to. So I I talk about this a lot. I do a lot of a lot of research around the racial wealth gap, and racial and social justice, and have the fortune uh, of having that work uh, disseminated to wide audiences. Very characteristic. Actually, I was amazed initially, but I understand it better. I have never been challenged on that data. No one has ever said to me, Shapiro, you're making this up. You know, the wealth of African Americans has got to be greater, or the gap's not that big. You know, where are you getting this stuff from? Um, no. The contest is about the narrative. It's about how do you understand that gap and what causes it. And what drives it? And here is where uh, it's not a surprise the society is widely divided about the stories of what accounts for that kind of inequality. And I want to suggest that uh, that's some of the work ahead of us. When I first started working with uh, this data on it with one of my great colleagues, Melvin Oliver, now the dean at, at Santa Barbara. This information, the data, literally had first become available. And nobody, we, nobody knew about it, so there's no way anybody could talk about it. A social movement of sorts has built up around closing the racial wealth gap. So thankfully, it is no longer a small coterie of academics talking to other academics about this, but they're community-based organizations. They're national policy advocate organizations. There are a lot of people working around trying to redress this particular kind of, uh, uh, that part of toxic inequality. 
And one level at which um, I like to think that we have succeeded is around the narrative. Well, last summer was the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington for Jobs and Justice. There have been like, a lot of conferences about that. President Obama stood up there and gave a presentation. This is one of the things he said. It was, if you will, the first at a very high level public acknowledgement that wealth between races has grown in the United States and is an issue. That doesn't get said unless there's pressure, unless there's a movement, if you will, behind it that's tilling the ground where a staffer or two says, hey, you know, we've got to throw this one in. So in a little bit of the time that's left, I want to turn to policy. And I want to suggest a couple of things. I want to put up for a, a bit of examination, because I only can, we only do with a couple of examples, that, given the time limits today, of how policy actively increases inequality. Now, if one ever had to set up goals for public policy, I don't think that would be one of the goals. The goal of public policy is to increase inequality. No, but it does. It's not even on the, the list of goals of public policy. It might be a byproduct, but let me talk about a couple of ways quickly that it does. I talked a little bit about housing already. There's something in our tax code called the mortgage interest deduction. I just gave it the initials MID. The mortgage interest deduction is part of a larger package of, in the tax code of what I call the wealth budget of the United States. It's not the budget that gives community block grants or WIC or food stamps or military allotments. It's that part of the tax code so people don't have to pay certain kinds of taxes for doing things that the tax code provides incentives for. The tax code provides every year about $400 billion worth of incentives for individual wealth building. That's not a one-off. It just happened last year. It doesn't happen again. Every single year it gets repeated. That's $400 billion. Some people don't have to pay in revenues. So other people then are going to have to fill that hole. That's sort of the way that works. By far, the largest, and that over a five-year period, uh, using some estimates from the, the Tax Policy Center from Urban and Student Brookings, over a five-year period, that amounts to $2.3 trillion. And I'm gonna, it's easy to throw off trillions of billions, and I'm going to give you some comparative numbers. <coughs> the mortgage interest deduction is the largest part of that, about $200 billion a year. $200 billion a year so that people can deduct from their taxes the interest they pay to buy their homes. It's one thing if that benefit were distributed fairly democratically or, or fairly in some kind of way we might think of, so that it really does benefit most American families. But the reality is that 72% of that big pot of benefits goes to the top 10%. That's because they've been in a higher tax bracket, they buy bigger homes, more expensive homes, their interests are higher, well, their interest payments are higher, like a whole bunch of other things. That $200 billion a year, figuratively, is a check that the federal government writes to homeowners to subsidize my home ownership and everybody else's. The same rules. The same sets of social policy don't apply to other folks. So here's a, two quick points of comparison. $200 billion a year uh, for people who already own homes to help them pay the mortgage on their homes and help them buy homes. We spend about $35 billion a year, uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development does, on Section 8 and other forms of assistance in public housing. So if one were to ask you in a quiz in a class, What's the housing policy of the United States government? Or we were to take that survey out to the streets, everybody or most people are going to say it's public housing. 
in Section 8, and it's providing rent subsidies. If you measure policy priorities by budgets, the mortgage interest deduction by far is the policy priority of the United States government. Second, I want to go through this one a little more quickly because I do want to get to some solutions here. Uh, the estate tax. Today, the estate tax um, is at a rate, um, I, I believe it's 35%. I may be wrong, but my mind's going a little bit. You're taxed at a rate of 35% to pass a large pool of wealth once one dies to heirs. But it's not every dollar that you pass along. The first $5.2 million are tax-free. A family then starts paying that 35% rate on the estate tax. That's how small a population it is. But it is legislation, um, I dare say, written at the behest of, clearly serves the purposes and benefits and privileges of that very small group. Just one illustration of that besides the, the exemption. So, there are very few things in the United States that are indexed to inflation. Social Security is one. That are indexed to inflation so that fam the family standard of living gets maintained. The estate tax exemption is. <laughs> so that um, next year, if inflation goes up 2%, uh, there'll be a 2% increase in how much is excluded tax rate. It won't be 5.2 million, it'll be 5.2 something something. All right. It doesn't mean a whole lot, right? Except to think that in comparison, food stamps, rental assistance, TANF, none of the social assistance benefits are indexed to inflation, other than Social Security. Policy priorities are very much askew. Not to leave everybody too depressed. There's some proven ways out of this. And I have focused, you know, on that perfect storm, I obviously been focusing on the, the racial wealth gap and rate and wealth inequality this evening. First, the mortgage interest deduction is ripe for reform. I'm part of happy and privileged to say I'm part of a, a group, uh, a little coalition, if you will. Uh, that's built around um, doing some very interesting deep dive uh, projections on what taxes would look like under different models or different scenarios that the Tax Policy Center that Urban is looking to adopt. And the prime one that's being modeled is uh, changes that can be done in the mortgage interest deduction. There, it's not because of lack of ideas. Um, the, ideas are, the ideas are all out there. Most of them would be much more progressive than the current system in a way that would make policy not so harmful in actually increasing uh, wealth inequality uh, year by year. Let me mention a couple other more proactive ones. One of you, well, here's one of my favorites. And I like to mention it because one probably nobody in the audience knows. Uh, raise your hand if you do. Family self-sufficiency. Because it's one, actually, that Patricia Arroyo took advantage of. When a family is in subsidized housing, the rent you pay is calculated to be a percent, a percent of, your, of your job income. Don't let me get too long. Just sort of glaze your eyes and I'll move on. Which means that the more you earn, the higher your rent is, which it should be. The incentive should be to, to uh, get out of public housing in, in a lot of ways. Hopefully there's decent enough housing in the free market to do that. Um, if you don't work, or you don't have a paid work income, um, your rent stays the same and it's pretty low. So as Patricia Arroyo, for example, started to earn that money at her first job, her rent went up. Talk about a policy disincentive. She's being 
penalized in, perhaps in her eyes. She can't save, it's hard to save because it, she's having to pay more. Here's what family self-sufficiency does. It's a federal program out of the Department of Housing and Urban Development, out of HUD, that takes that rent, extra rent money you would pay because you're earning more of a job and puts it in an escrow account. Now, there's a fancy formula, let's not go there yet. But the concept is, instead of paying more rent, you put it into an account. You have to be part of the program, you have to have five-year goals, and you have to meet every one of those goals. And at the end of those five years, you get to take every single dollar out and do whatever you want with it, because it's yours. <coughs> Patricia Arroyo bought her, that was a down payment for her first home. She was a, a participant in one of the Los Angeles City Family Self-Sufficiency Programs. She couldn't have bought that home on $20,000 a year salary. Not for, maybe not 50 she could. So here was a pathway created or helped to be created by public policy. And I, personally, I think it's an ingenious kind of, kind of notion. It's FSS or Family Self-Sufficiency is a policy uh, that many people now are trying to ramp up because it, it's, when it's done right, it really uh, has proven to be very effective. Lastly, because I do want to have some time to open this up for conversations, um, there is a remarkable amount of action at the federal level, eh, a little bit, but really at the state and municipal levels around what are called children's savings accounts. These are accounts that, uh, where a family sit, puts some money aside, uh, targeted for their children's secondary education. It can be college, it can be welding school, it can be whatever, skill development, post high school. Uh, the hope of the, of the program is mostly for, 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 for college or university or, or state college or, or whatever, higher education. Those are the skills that are needed. Money, family puts money in an account. Often that account can be matched by a public or private entity. And over, if those accounts are done at birth, which the entire state of Oklahoma is presently an experimental site, seriously, where a, a very generous film, National Philanthropic Foundation has taken a sample of every single child born in that state in one year, it was like five years ago now. Half of them were given this account with a thousand dollars. And if the families matched it, this foundation would also match that. And in the controlled experiment, the other half of the families in the state were given a thousand dollars and were never contacted. And we're not given the opportunity to build it. They had to do it all themselves. Statewide. The state of Maine has a program that's doing a not experimental, but every single newborn in the state of Maine has an account set. Now it's not a thousand, I think it's like fifty bucks. The city of San Francisco has a program called K that allows us to measure the distributional impact on the racial wealth gap of a proposed policy. So if you can take uh, Congressman Ryan's uh, policy about food stamps, or a, president's, a presidential candidate's policy about something uh, about EITC, or somebody's policy about the estate tax, and we can run it through this tool and be able to say, what is the is that going to close the racial wealth gap? How much? Is it going to widen it? What's the impact of that? And lastly on this, um, and I think it's a good point to close out. Um, we have done a lot of this work with uh, an organization uh, that's about to propose a policy that I know will be a winner in this audience uh, for forgiveness of student debts. <laughs> Those, all those loans, not only the current students, that are, but some that are post-students and some that are parents of uh, people who had been students. Okay. And we helped them model through and we found for them the sweet spot in the policy design. That is, what was the level of eligibility 
that would have the most action. It wasn't 100%. It wasn't reducing the loan 100%. It was like reducing it at a certain level, or more like 50%, and it tinkered with the eligibility. Right, so my point is that with the bad charts I put up, there are a lot of people, a lot of organizations that are working tirelessly around deep remedies to reform this. And I am pleased to be one of them. And I would like to leave with that last slide. Uh, you can get some more information at our website. Uh, follow us on Twitter if you want to do that kind of thing. But also note that their careers, good careers, in doing this kind of research at a very high level, that didn't exist very few years ago. Uh, we currently are looking for one. So thank you very much.